Father, we ask for you to do your holy, glorious work within our souls. Lord, we know that being justified is not the end. It's just the very beginning. And we have a whole lifetime where you're working in us by your spirit to make us like your son. And we pray, Lord, that you would do that, that work within us today. Sanctify us, Lord. Make us holy. Make us like Jesus. Encourage us and motivate us, Lord, for the new year coming up. Reset us, Lord. Put our minds in the right direction. And give us a will to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tonight at midnight, we're going to go from 2023 to 2024. Yes. I'm right. This is New Year's Eve, right? <laughs> okay. So I was born in 1959, so I've seen a lot of New Year's. It's even kind of crazy to say that, that I actually go back to the generation of the 50s. Crazy. But every year at this time, I find myself thinking about the idea of, of the passing of time. And I think it's good for us at least once a year for, to collectively think about that together. All of us are like an hourglass and the sands are dripping out of it. We have so much sand in that hourglass. When the sand has gone through, our life is over. We've all got one life to live. We'll soon be passed. As the old adage goes, only what's done for Christ will last when our life is over. So I want to think with you about time again this morning. I've been meditating on, on this kind of a thing on New Year's for about 34 years. So each year, I, I tend to, to do that. And so we need to be asking ourselves, well, how, how much of my hourglass has already passed? Of course, we don't know that, because none of us knows how long we're going to live. But let's say we don't die young. We die 80, 85 years old. How much of your hourglass has passed? Is it 50%? For me, it's way more than that. It's like 75%, or maybe more than that. So I don't have a whole lot of sands left. But you young ones, you have your whole life in front of you. What are you going to do with that life? That's the question we need to be thinking about. How many opportunities do we still have to do the works of God? So consider briefly with me the, the outline of a sermon preached by Jonathan Edwards back in the 1700s. And this is just going to be very brief. But he told us in his sermon so many years ago why he considered time to be so precious. And he said, number one, a happy or miserable eternity depends on what we do with time. I'll repeat that. A happy or miserable eternity depends on what you do in this lifetime. When we die, our state is fixed and unalterable. You cannot change it. If you end up in hell, you can never get to heaven. If you end up in heaven, you can never get to hell. Your state is fixed for eternity. Our rewards in heaven also depend on what use we make of time in this life. And you say, oh, I don't care about rewards. Well, someday you will. I think maybe you can say that now. But when you get to glory and you think, I, I could have had this kind of a relationship and I'm but I have this kind of a relationship with the Lord. I, I really don't know exactly what goes on into these rewards, but I know there's something important to that because why else would the Bible emphasize rewards for the believer? So that's the first point Jonathan Edwards made. A happy or miserable eternity depends on what we do with time. Secondly, time is very short. That's why it's so precious. Whenever something is you have such a, a, a low commodity. It, there, there's just not much of it to go around. The price of that thing is jacked way up. Well, time is very short. Consider time in relationship to eternity. It's like a blip. Even if you live to be 100 years, that's nothing compared to eternity. It's very short. Thirdly, we are uncertain of its continuance. We don't know how long it's going to be. Today could be the last day I live on earth. So time is precious because I, I really don't know how much of it I have left. And number four, when it is past, we can never get it back. It's different from things like money because when money is lost, you can make that back. Like if you lose it in the stock market, 
Well, you can go and you can reinvest it somewhere else and make all the money back that you just lost. But when you spend time, you can never go back and get that time back. It's lost forever. So it's precious. If people wasted their money like they waste their time, we would think that they were crazy. Like if someone got up every morning, took out a $100 bill out of his billfold and lit it on fire. And that's his morning ritual while he had his cup of coffee. Light, lights a $100 bill on fire. I said, that guy is nuts. <laughs> He's absolutely nuts. But we do that. Christians, we can do that with our time. We just light it on fire. We waste it day after day after day. So I just want to encourage you to think about the preciousness of your time and what you're going to do with it. And how God can use you with the time you have remaining on this earth. And we're going to look at an incident in the life of Jesus. It's John chapter 9. And this is the healing of a man that was born blind. So let's pick it up in verse 1 and read the story. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but we'll read the first seven verses. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Here's the verse I want you to think deeply about today. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. So this morning, we're going to spend the bulk of our time zeroing in on verse four, a statement that Jesus made concerning this man and the miracle he was about to perform. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. <clears throat> and what I want to do this morning, it's going to be a super simple message, probably pretty short, actually. What I'm going to do is just focus on words of, the, of verse 4. I'm going to take either a word or a phrase and meditate on it with you together. So the first couple of words are day and night from verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So what did Jesus mean by day and night in this verse? That's what we need to ask ourselves. He says he can only do his works while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. But then the very next verse, in verse 5, he says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So, when Jesus is no longer in the world, it's going to be night. It's going to be dark. While he's in the world, it's day and it's light. That tells me that when Jesus says night is coming, he's talking about when he's not going to be in the world anymore. Because while he's in the world, it's daytime and, it, and it's, he's the light of the world. When he's not in the world anymore, it's going to be night and it's going to be dark. So I believe what Jesus is saying is, we, we must work the works of him who sent me now while we are alive in this world because after we are dead, we're no longer going to be able to work. Our opportunities for doing what God wants us to do are now. It's not after we die. That's why time is precious because we have a very small commodity of it. We have a small amount of it compared to the eternity where we're going. At death, it's, it's too late. All opportunity for doing good is gone forever at death. Okay, second word we want to meditate on is the word we. We must work the works of him who sent me. Notice Jesus doesn't say I. His disciples were surrounding him and he said, we must work the works of him who sent me. In other words, he involves them in these works. And he says, it's not just me that is responsible to work the works of him who sent me. You are too. We must do that. And I would believe, since we are disciples as well, that this would apply to us, to every generation of Christians. We, as Christians, must work the works of him who sent us, as long as it is day, as long as we're in the world, because night is coming when no one can work. If we want to make an impact for Christ in our world, we've got to do it now. 
there's going to be no opportunity after we're gone. One life to live will soon be passed. Third word I want you to meditate on. The word must. We must work. What does that word tell you? What was that? Can't be lazy. Can't be lazy. Okay, okay. Can't be lazy. Mian, what did you say? No choice. No choice. It's something that you don't have a choice of. It's something you have to do. We must. We must do it. It's a word of um, urgency. It's not something you can be cavalier about and say, well, okay, Sarah, Sarah, what will be will be, you know. You just kind of live your life the way you want to and hope things turn out for the best. He's, he's not pointing in that direction. He's pointing to, to working the works of the one who sends you, and you must do it. There's a sense of necessity laid on us to do the works of him who sent us. So do you feel that must in your own soul when it comes to doing the works of God? Do you feel, could you say with Jesus, I must do the works of him who sent me while I'm in this world? Okay, another phrase to meditate on. Works of him. We must work the works of him. In other words, we must work his works while it is day. So what does he mean? What is the works of him? I think he means the, the works of of God. The, the works that God has given Jesus to do, he must do those works. There were specific works that God gave to Jesus, and Jesus says, they're laid upon me, and I must do them. What are the works that he has given to us to do? See, that should be running through our mind. What are the works that God has given me to do while well, I'm in this world? The works of him, his works, the works that he has designed and given to us. Do you remember Ephesians 2, the very last verse? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. God has works for you to do. He's prepared them beforehand. He wants you to walk in them daily. Jesus said, in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He said it was his food to do God's works. Now what does food do for a person? It gives him energy, right? It's like, it's like taking your car to the gas station and filling it up with fuel. Our body needs fuel in order to have the energy it needs to do what God has called it to do. Jesus said, my food, what energizes me, and food also satisfies you as well. I would put those two together. It energizes and it satisfies. He says, doing God's works is what energizes me and what satisfies me. It's like food. Food for the body, doing the works of God is like food for my soul. Instead of draining Jesus, he was energized by doing the works of God. And remember, he said this right after he was speaking to the Samaritan, not the Samaritan woman. Yeah, the woman at the well. So he had just been witnessing to her and pointing out her sin and doing his work of evangelism. And he says, that, that's like food for my soul, to do that kind of work. He also said at the very end of his life, in John 17, verse 4, I glorified you, Father, on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So all the way through Jesus' life, he was very aware of the work that God had given him to do. The culmination of that was his death on the cross, which he was about to undergo. But there were other works that led up to that final great work of sacrifice. And Jesus said, I glorified you on the earth. How did I do that? I accomplished the work you gave me to do. Folks, as Christians, I think we can say something similar. The way we glorify God is accomplishing the work that he's given us to do. So we need to each ask ourselves, what are the works God has given me to do? And I'm not suggesting that they're identical for every Christian. Something, there's going to be a lot of overlap. 
There's a lot of things that will be the same for all of us, but there's going to be some differences too. God has called each one of us in different ways. He's gifted us in different ways. We all have different spiritual gifts, different callings in life. Some are single, some are married, some have children, some don't. And so you have to take all of that into account, but God does have works that he has called each of his children to do. Okay, meditate next on the word work. We must work the works of him who sent me. He didn't say, we must think about working the works of him who sent me. Or we must talk about doing God's works. Or we must read about doing God's works. Or study about doing God's works. Or pray about doing God's works. None of those things are bad. They're all good. But that's not what Jesus said. We must work the works of him who sent me. What does he mean? Do them. Actually do them. We Christians are famous for our, our Bible studies, where we will study the Bible for months and years on end without ever actually doing what we're studying about. Jeez. I mean, isn't that true? <laughs> we, we love to study the Bible, but when do we get really serious about putting it into action? One of the things I'm really thankful for is the, this new Blessing Sunday thing that we've started because we are actually right we're actually putting into practice what we see in the Bible instead of talking about it on Sunday we're actually doing it so I, I'm, I'm very thankful for that you guys are familiar with the Nike slogan just do it well at some point we just got to do it we got to stop talking about it studying about it we we already probably have studied enough to know all about what we're supposed to do why don't we do it So I hope that 2024 will be the year that we can say, you know, we, st we really made strides in actually applying and putting into practice what we see in Scripture. Last phrase, night is coming when no man can work. Night is coming. None of us knows when that night will come. Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be 20 years from now. Could be 40 years from now. We just don't know. But night is coming when no man can work. Life is so short, and we have so much to crowd into it, we can't spare a, or waste a moment of it, a wise man said. If you, just consider this for a minute, if you were to die today, try to imagine, okay, I'm, I'm going to die today, would you be happy, would you be pleased with the way you spent your life? Would you have regrets? Would you say, I should have invested more in this area or that area? And why didn't I do that? Why did I not do that? Why did, why did I waste it? Why did I squander it? Because if we have regrets, maybe we have an opportunity to change that now while we still have time. That's the only reason. I'm not saying it's wrong to have regrets. I'm saying maybe we can learn from our regrets. Okay? Someone put it this way. Life is too short for us to do everything we want to do, but it's long enough for us to do everything God wants us to do. I'll repeat that again. Life is too short for us to do everything we want to do, but it's long enough for us to do everything God wants us to do. Because God knows the amount of time he's given to us. And so he's appointed certain works for us that will fit within that time frame. In Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, the preacher says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. All your might. For there's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, that's, that's death or the grave, where you're going. So do it now and do it with all your might. In other words, live life to the fullest. Give life everything you've got. That's the idea. Now, I'm, I know that was pretty brief. We're going to start applying now. <laughs> so do you guys realize that, that you're going to be judged according to your works? As evangelicals, we do not put much stock in works. In fact, works can be a dirty word. It can be taboo. The Bible doesn't treat works like that. Works are important. And the Bible tells us that we're going to be judged according to our works. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Jesus talks about coming, sitting on his glorious throne, dividing all men into either the sheep or the goats. And th those that are the sheep will receive the eternal kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. 
And he says the sheep are going to be known by things like feeding the poor, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner, inviting the stranger in, visiting the sick, visiting the prisoner. That's what he says the sheep are like. That's how you know a sheep. He gives his life to these works. So, and then he's going to judge all men, and he will sift and divide men, and the, the sheep are going to have the evidence that they gave their life to the works God gave them to do. It's not that they're saved by those works, but that's the fruit of their life, obedience to Christ. Also, Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37, Jesus said, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they will give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now he's talking about judgment day, and he's going to be reviewing our words. Because our words are the, they're, they're the fruit of our hearts. Maybe you guys can, th- I'm not thinking of the, the verse right off the top of my head. Yes, say it again loud, Joe. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, so th- what we say is just proof of what's going on inside our hearts. And the Lord is going to take those words that we've spoken and he's going to use them to bring judgment. Because it's going to show where our heart was. Where was our heart during this lifetime? But again, it's another passage that shows us that our works, here our words, will be the criteria of God's judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad our actions are important folks your deeds are important they're going to factor when God brings judgment at the end of time I'm not saying that God is going to let someone into heaven because they did enough good deeds and the other person that didn't do enough good deeds is going to be sent to hell that your deeds evidence whether you believed in Christ or not your life will be put on display as evidence of whether you were a real Christian. Do you see that? Becoming a Christian is not just a matter of inward faith that has no outward effect. Man, if, if you have that idea, get rid of it right away. The Christian life is a life that can be seen. So as, we, as evangelicals, we are way too quick to diminish the importance of our works. They have no part to play in our justification. That is true. We're justified apart from works of the law. But they do have a part to play in evidencing that we are genuine. And God is going to use that criteria to show to the whole world who was his and who wasn't. So do you find corresponding actions flowing from the new heart God has given you in regeneration? Do you see some actions flowing there? We should just ask that question this morning. So, for the unsaved, let's see if we can apply this idea of time and the preciousness of time to those that are not saved. If you're not a Christian yet this morning, listen very carefully. You have a very short amount of time. Your lifetime is like a blip. It will be gone before you know it, and you only have a certain amount of time to get right with God. And so why are you waiting? Why are you waiting to repent of sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ? Today is the day of salvation. Why are you waiting for tomorrow? You may not have tomorrow. So please hear my words and hear them well. Get right with God if you're not right with God. Be reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ. Put your trust in him. Follow him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Give up your old way of life. Repent of that old way of life and give yourself to Jesus Christ. He will change you. He'll make you a new person. Thank you, Lord. So that's, that's the only application I've got for the unsaved. Get right with God. Matthew Henry put it this way. This we know. That if the work of life be not done when our time is done, we are undone forever. Wow. Could you say that again? This we know, that if the work of life be not done when our time is done, we are undone forever. So forsake your old life. Put your trust in Jesus Christ and begin a life of following him in obedience. 
Find out what he wants you to do from this book. It's all here. And start doing it as evidence that you love him and you want to serve him. You want to follow him. Okay, but most of the people here are saved. So let's, let's talk about us. What do we do with this message of the preciousness of time? We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. I hope when you leave today, you'll have that verse ringing in your ears. It'll be memorized. That'd be great. I, that'd be a wonderful goal. <laughs> that'd be better than anything I could ask for if the, if the words of Jesus were left ringing in your ears all week long. Okay, for the saved. Give your lives to doing the works of God. Redeem the time. If God has called you to something, don't put it off. Don't sit there and do nothing. Do, do what he's called you to do. Our time is a gift of God and we're going to have to give an account for how we spent it. We are stewards of this life. A steward is a slave who manages someone else's possessions for them. That's who we are. We're slaves of Christ. We are to manage what he has given to us. And one of the most precious things he's given to you is your lifetime here on earth. So perhaps we can simplify how we would apply this to Christians by going to Matthew 22. And there in 35 to 40, we have a lawyer who comes up to Jesus. And the lawyer asked Jesus a question, testing him. He said, teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So if you want to make the Christian life really, really simple, you can make it real simple. Love God and love people. That's really, you boil down the Christian life. That's what God is requiring of us as his followers. Love God supremely and love your fellow man. So let's talk about loving God. Jesus said, in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, that means that we are going to be serious about obeying Jesus. He is Lord after all. The Lord is the master. If he's the Lord, then we have no right to pick and choose which of his commandments we're going to pay attention to or be serious about. If you are to be a Christian, you're going to have to repent of all known sin, not just the ones that you think are the worst, or that might get you in trouble with other people. All sin is grievous to God, and if we know that we are sinning against God, then we should be grieved at heart about that, and offended that we would do that to God. So if we love God, not only will we be concerned about holiness, we will we'll worship Him. A Christian is a worshiper of God. That includes a life of prayer, a life of of intake of God's word. We live in an age today, for 1500 years people didn't have this glorious opportunity. We live in an age where you can have your own Bible. Before the printing press was uh, created, invented, people didn't have that luxury. We don't even think about it. We take for granted that we own our own copy of the scriptures. So. Take advantage of that. That's one of the great means God has given you to connect with him, to know God. He, he's, this is his self-revelation. You want to know God? You want to have a relationship with your creator? This is going to be your greatest help to knowing the living God. Not only that, but um, scripture memorization, scripture meditation, uh, reading, scripture study, all of those things are going to be means to help you worship God. And I would include also things like singing to God. Do you take time to, do, to sing to the Lord? To sing praises to Him? To worship Him? That should be part of our, our normal Christian life. A life of worship of God. Don't, don't just wait for the saints to gather. You can do that by yourself. You don't need to wait till Sunday. We should have this going on constantly. If you love God, not only will you worship him, you'll repent and forsake all known sin that he shows you. If you love God, you will obey him by seeking to make disciples. 
which in addition to the great commandment, we have the great commission. And the great commission was given to the church to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So that should be on your heart as well, that you want to be used by God to, to bring the gospel to people that don't know Christ. And you should be thinking about, well, Lord, how would you want to use me in that work? I know that you might use me differently than somebody else, but you've got something for me to do, some role to play in this great commission work. So there we have loving God. What about loving people? Well, think about loving people in terms of the different relationships in your life. We have relationships to family. We have relationships to the church. And we've got relationships to people outside of the church. Call that the world or non-Christians. So those are three big divisions. So if you're going to love people, start with your family. Loving your family. If you're married, it includes being devoted to your spouse. It means serving your spouse where they need your help, supporting them, encouraging them, helping them, praying for them. Those are all, if you're married, th this should be the part of your daily life, is that you're committed to your spouse. If you have children, devotion to those children, teaching those children, praying for them and with them, modeling for them what it means to pray. So they can say, oh, well, mom and dad pray like that. I guess that's how you pray <laughs> because they're seeing it. Um, helping your children, playing with them, talking with them, discipling them. Do you, do you, those of you who have children in the home, do you look at your children as potential disciples of Jesus Christ? And your job is to disciple them, to know the Lord and to walk with the Lord. That's the way we should look at our children. This is another stewardship that God has given to us, our children. We are stewards of those children for just a brief amount of time. Pretty soon they're going to be out of the nest and gone. But we have a precious opportunity now to, to build our, ourselves into their lives. Disciplining your children. That's another part of loving your children. Disciplining them. When they have done wrong, you need to learn to train them, correct them, show them what is right, show them what God wants from their life. And modeling Jesus Christ for them which is what, a big, tall order, but is one what we have. Okay, so there we have our relationship to our family, loving our family. What about loving the church? How do we do that? Well, there's like 40-some different one another's in the New Testament. We're told to love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, show hospitality to one another. The list goes on and on and on. Basically, we are to be devoted to one another within the family of God as well. <laughs> Building in, into each other's lives, seeking to edify, to build up one another. It might include you discipling a younger believer, someone who's just come to faith and you're well along the path. Why not take that person under your wing and start to spend some time with that person? And that can mean many different things. It can mean just times of hanging out over coffee and talking about life and how they could approach situations in life in a godly way from a biblical perspective. It can mean all kinds of things, but we should be pouring ourselves into other people uh, that the, the Lord gives you, as the Lord gives you opportunity for that and arranges relationships. Includes serving the saints. When we know of a saint in need within the body, loving the church means to serve that person in whatever way we can, bringing meals. There, there is a saint that doesn't even come to our church, but she's part of a neighborhood Bible study here, and when we all, well, I didn't get it, but Debbie and mom got COVID, they were just down for the count, you know, it was pretty bad, they were pretty sick. She brought over <clears throat> this huge basket of food that lasted us like at least a week, <laughs> and I just think, what a, what a beautiful expression of love. And we're not even in the same local church, but she just God put that on her heart for us. Mutual spiritual ministry. Pastors are called to spiritual ministry to the body of Christ, but so are the rest of the saints. God has given all of us the ability to minister to one another in spiritual ways. So, so don't discount yourself or... Or count yourself out. Well, I could never do that. I'm not a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor to minister to one another. In fact, we try to make room for that every Sunday. For all the saints to be able to minister to one another here. And just continue that throughout the week. 
Okay, what about non-Christians? How do we love non-Christians? I think the most loving thing we can do for a non-Christian is to bring them to Christ because they will be saved for eternity if they come to know the Lord. But that's not the only thing we are to do in terms of loving non-Christians. We're to serve them wherever they have need and we are able to meet that need, then a great way to love a non-Christian is to meet his need, whatever it is. Whether it's shoes for someone who has none, or socks, or a blanket, or food, or some kind of shelter, uh, whatever that need happens to be. And it's not always outward physical, too. It can be emotional, it can be mental. There's people who are so needy. So we just need to look around at our world and be open that the Lord may want to use me in the life of these other people Someone once said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think there's probably a lot of truth to that. Do people know how much you care about them? There's two things that are going to survive this, this world. People and God's word. God's word's going to last forever. People are going to be in heaven or hell forever. So we ought to be giving ourselves to the word of God and to people. Ministering to people, loving people. So this includes meeting both physical and spiritual needs of non-Christian people. When should people do these kind of works? When should we love God and love people? Today. <laughs> because we have no other time. The past is already gone. We can't love anyone in the past. That doesn't exist anymore. The future doesn't exist yet either. All we have is right now. So every morning when you get up, tell yourself, this is the day that the Lord has given me to love you and to love other people. Show me how to do that the best way I can today, Lord. Direct my steps. I need your help in this, Lord. So as we conclude, I wanted to throw out some discussion questions for us to really think this through. The first question is, are there works that you believe God wants you to do that you have not yet begun to do yet? And if anybody's willing, we can actually share some of those things. Because one of my discussion questions is, is, how can we encourage one another in doing the works God has called us to do? That's what the church is all about. We're to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That's what's to happen when the church gathers, according to Hebrews 10.25. So, take a minute and think. Do you believe that there are certain works that God wants you to do, but you haven't started yet? And what would those kinds of things be? Does anything come to mind for anybody? I think about these things as a calling that will, will, what's the word, ennoble or give greater value, even though it may be difficult, like I was thinking about you. If you can see this as a calling, wow, God has called me to this. This is a high calling in my life. And a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. So just a, it's kind of like the thing what we were talking about. If we can become bitter at people, but if you look at what you're doing as not for that person, but as serving Christ, that gives so much value. Um, I, I'm not expressing myself very well. It lifts it up to where this is not just this peon little terrible thing I have to do. This is wonderful because I'm serving the king of kings right now, no matter what that thing is. Okay, I hopefully got across that time. <laughs> okay, let me ask another discussion question. We're called to love family, church, and our world. Which of those spheres do you think you're doing best in, and which are you doing worst in? Okay, and my last question, this is more of a, just a thought question, but how can we encourage one another within the body to do those, the works God has given them to do in 2024. You know, kind of looking out for, for each other and, and stimulating and encouraging. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we've had a lot to think about this morning. We're asking, Lord, that you would be the one who puts on our heart the works you want us to be doing. We don't want to be in bondage some kind of legal bondage to a system or to a law. We, Lord, we want these works that we do to come out of relationship to you, and we want you to guide us in them, Lord. And we're asking that in this coming year, when we know you're calling us to something, we would get up and do it.
we wouldn't just think about it. Lord, that we'd put our shoe leather. We, we'd get up and actually implement that thing, Lord. So help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And Lord, use this little church in some, some way to, make, to leave a mark in this world, to make it a better place, to bring people to Christ, to love people. Use us, Lord, as extensions of your hand and your feet in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.